Hello everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about more about these things. IGBTs, you should know what that is by now. But first, before I do, just talk a little bit about YouTube and stuff like that. My YouTube channel, personally. My last video about IGBTs, I've actually had a pretty good response. Better than what I thought I would have. And some people have commented and sent me messages and emails and they've asked me about IGBTs and their projects and any advice I could give them on that. And I just want to say that that's good. I actually like talking to people about all kinds of electronic stuff, IGBTs and stuff like that. So if you want to send me a message or leave me a comment, ask me a question, you're not bothering me. Uh, I really like to talk about that stuff and we could talk for hours about this stuff. Um, and a couple of people I actually have talked to for days about this stuff, emailing back and forth, and it's all good. It's all a lot of fun to me, actually. I like to talk about this stuff, and that's one of the reasons why I do these kind of videos, the explaining and stuff like that. I really like to to share the stuff that I've learned about this kind of stuff, power electronics and all of that. So anyways, to get on with it. In my last video, I did explain stuff about the gate control and switching the IGBT to its on state and off state and you want to do that in a fast manner without destroying the IGBT or the gate driver but I'm gonna go a little more into detail about that now bear with me here we're gonna switch it around a little bit see if I can get on it okay I think you can see that. It says typical IGBT turn off. Okay, so when an IGBT is on and it is conducting, the voltage and the current stabilize, but what happens when it turns off, this is a current, and as that current falls off right there, when the gate signal is removed, the gate the voltage, the bus voltage and the gate voltage too spike up like that and this is a bus voltage here it spikes above the bus voltage and the reason that happens is because of the inductance of the bus that is how much of a magnetic field that bus the cables carrying the power to the IGBT how much a magnetic field they can actually hold and if we make those cables or the bus bars which they should be bus bars if we make those shorter and closer together it won't be able to store that same magnetic field so as I said in the earlier video the bus bars really would be best and I see a lot of videos and images of people running their IGBTs with just wires and that's not gonna cut it you really do you have to have uh, a, a bus bars and capacitors going to an IGBT or it will blow up now there is a formula for that, the voltage, and it's V equals L times DI over DT, and basically that means the voltage of an inductor is equal to the inductance, that is how much magnetic field it can store, multiplied by the rate of current change. So there are a couple things we can do to get rid of that voltage spike, just as the formula suggests we can reduce the inductance that's reducing L or we can switch the IGBT slower that's DI over DT so it'll be a lower rate of current change but the thing about that is like I explained before if we have a longer transition to between on and off with an IGBT there will be more heat dissipated and that's generally not a very good thing for electronics as most people should know by now it's really not good for anything to get hot and the other thing about, of course I should save that for later, but the other thing about getting an IGBT hot is it decreases its performance in other ways. But anyways, so if we want to make an IGBT use less power, waste less power, get not as hot, then we actually need to decrease the inductance of the bus system and we need to make them closer together so that way we can actually switch it faster if the, induct if the inductance is too large in order to prevent the IGBT from being destroyed from an over voltage 
then that means we actually have to compromise on the switching frequency and the gate drive itself. Then that means we have to use a larger gate resistor and make it switch slower. And that will save it from an over voltage, but it might be destroyed because of heat. So, in a way, if you have a more adequate cooling system or an, a cooling system that can remove more heat, then essentially what that means is you can switch it a little bit slower and it won't be subjected to the same voltage. But if we have a lower inductance, then that means we can actually switch it faster and we, will, we won't get that same loss in heat in the first place. So it really depends on the type of system that you're making and the type of project that you're working on really. Is it, you know, is it a budget project? Is it a big deal? Um, if it's not really that big of a deal, uh, just a couple of pieces of copper pipe, if you smash them down with a hammer, that's a good enough bus. But, I mean, if it's something that's serious, then it actually probably is best to get a sheet of copper and take it to a machine shop and have them cut it out, you know, like on a CNC plasma cutter, something like that. You know, you get the idea. It really all depends. And basically, the better you make it, the less inductance you have and the more cooling you have, the longer it's going to last. Um, and that brings me to the next point, which I kind of spoiled earlier, but that is cooling the IGBT. Um, if you look on some data sheets for IGBTs, it will say things like, this IGBT can run at 150 Celsius, and that's about 305 Fahrenheit, if you don't understand the Celsius, and that's way too hot. Um, and they say it will run like that, but it might, but <laughs> probably not in a very long time. And the other thing is, too, just because the IGBT can run at 305 Celsius, not 305 Celsius, 305 Fahrenheit, 150 Celsius, that doesn't mean the heat sink can actually get that hot because there is a thermal impedance between the IGBT itself and the heat sink that it's on. So, basically, like I said before, a better cooling system means you won't have to go as crazy with making the inductance smaller and making it switch off, switch on and off faster. You can be a little more relaxed in the gate resistor. You can make it a little bit higher if you've got a little better cooling. But the other thing is, especially when you're working with a half bridge or basically more than one IGBTs that are opposing each other. Let's take a look at that. If you're working with a half bridge like this, you definitely want to keep those cool. Because you've got the lower one here, and then the upper one here, and the output is here. But if the IGBTs are running hot, then that means there's an increased tail current. That's one of the terms that they use for it. But really what that means is, when this, the gate driver, turns the IGBT off, if it's hotter, it will actually stay on longer even though you've told it to shut off even if you've removed the gate signal it will still conduct for a longer time if it's hot and that means if this one is still conducting and then this one turns on that's a positive that's a negative bus it's just going to be a short circuit and of course you know what happens with that so Really, if we can keep those IGBTs cooler, we'll reduce that risk. But, cooling of course can be a problem. And it's something that I have encountered myself. Of course, everything I talk about I've encountered myself. You know, blowing them all up. But one of the best solutions for an IGBT is liquid cooling but there are flaws with that as well as with air cooling but liquid cooled heat sinks they're very expensive and they're difficult to maintain and things like that you know they get corrosion they get fungus forming and stuff like that and there's pumps and they're loud and they go bad and the bearings wear out but one of the best solutions for them actually is refrigeration and today we're gonna play with a little bit of that alright like I said 
refrigeration for these things. Now this is a chiller, so it is a liquid cooled. Let's take a look at that. Is that a GBT? No gate driver setup and the water block. And those tubes go to this. The chiller, reservoir. There's a compressor, condenser, and that system runs R22. And it probably has a capacity probably about one ton, that's 12,000 BTUs an hour. Let's turn it on. Oops. Take a look inside the box. Really quick. Just basic electrical stuff here. Transformer there, sends power through the thermostat, sends power through the pressure switch. When the thermostat closes, the main contactor closes and it starts the compressor. And the pressure switch, when that contact closes, it starts up that contactor there, which runs the condenser fans. So it'll pump up to about 200 pounds on the high side before it kicks on. And then, the evaporator, of course, is in here, and this water will turn into a giant ball of ice. It has done it. This whole bucket has turned into a ball of ice. Pump there. Of course, cooling plate again. And, like I say, the cooler the IGBT is, the more quickly it will shut off and it runs less risk of interfering with the operation of the other IGBT. Now, let's take a look at this. The water block is quite simple. It's just a piece of aluminum, just like this. And what I've done with one of these is I've got a drill bit and drill it all the way through there. And then tap those and then put the fitting in and pump that water through it. But eventually I plan to just run straight refrigerant through it and use it just as an evaporator, just as here, so we'll get less losses. And we can actually make it colder that way. Now the fans have come on. So the compressor's pumped it up. Now, this is the same IGBT induction heater, that's what we're going to be playing with today as I showed before in my other video, but I've got a better inductor system there. It's got the water flowing through it, so it won't overheat, of course. And that's just the input rectifier and the capacitors. This is just running from 120 now. I could run it from 240, but I haven't got a matching network for the inductor, so the current is really high on the output. But, let's just take a look over here. These are the capacitors. 2200 microfarads, 350 volts DC. They are running in center tapped, series parallel. So the common from the coil is just there. And then the output is on the common of the IGBT. Got a snubber capacitor there. HCPL3120 optically isolated gate drivers and two power supplies, isolated supply. So here is essentially the wiring diagram for it. I don't use that Zener diode there, but essentially that is it. Let's take a look. It's basically that right there. The center tap capacitor, the induction coil, and the IGVT half bridge. So, let's see, just for a minute, what it will do. And the power is only. It's only about two kilowatts, nothing to get too excited over. It's 
Signal from the PC, of course. 10 kilohertz this time. See if I can just get that. In the right spot there. What can we play with? Let's stick a knife in it, see what it does. And there it goes. It'll run for 30 seconds and then automatically shut off. Computer's programmed to. Not bad. Of course, we can put other silly stuff in it. See what happens with that. Might have to run that for one minute. Let's try that a little bit more. That's pretty hot. And it caught my carpet on fire. So now it's gonna stink. But anyways. That's it for today. I hope you guys learned a little more and I'll try to make some better videos. See you soon.